OK, so uh, I make that uh, one o'clock. Let's get started, folks. Thank you so much for joining us here and uh, looking forward to sharing some uh, uh, ideas and strategies on how to make your sales negotiations easier. Uh, if you're uh, uh, joining from LinkedIn, uh, thank you for registering. If you've registered on the website, again, thank you. And if you're watching the recording uh, after the event on YouTube, uh, please be sure to uh, like and subscribe, as they say. So, uh, first up, let us just try and set the scene. So, uh, one of the things that I've, I have found in my own experience, and I'm not for one minute suggesting I'm an expert negotiator, but one of the things that I found in my own experience is that emotions drive behaviour, uh, and emotions are what primarily influence sales negotiations. Now that doesn't necessarily uh, mean that that's a good thing. Uh, however, you've got to be aware of that and uh, you have to be conscious of what emotions that you take into the, the negotiation. And uh, if I was to ask people, and please feel free to use the Q&A, uh, the Q&A function here. If I was to ask you what emotions do you take into negotiation? Uh, my guess is that uh, most people are going into negotiation with some form of anxiety, uh, some form of fear. Uh, they, they, there's, there's a fear of losing, uh, a fear of making a mistake. Uh, uh, there's, it can be stressful. It can be uh, very, very uh, uh, intimidating even in certain situations. If, for example, you're going into a boardroom. So uh, the majority of the emotions that we take into a negotiation unfortunately in most cases tend to be negative emotion, uh, emotions and uh, if I just pick on one in particular fear and fear of losing the the, uh, the biggest debilitator uh, in terms of emotions uh, of a human being's ability to function is fear and and uh, uh, fear f-e-a-r the the acronym for that is future event appearing real and the keyword there is appearing f-e-a-r future event appearing real it appears real but it's not real because it's not happened yet and i i would urge you all to think back about numerous scenarios in your own life not necessarily a, a negotiation but numerous scenarios in your own life whether it be sales life and in, in business or in, in your personal life where you were maybe frightened or, an or anxious about a particular event or something that was going to happen. Maybe it was a call with a, a, a customer who was unhappy. And uh, it, it actually, in nearly every case, in nearly every case, it never turns out as bad as we think it's going to be. Uh, we, we build those, we turn those uh, molehills into mountains and always uh, seem to make them worse than they are. So. What's the way around this? And, and I'm sure people are going to be groaning when I say this, but uh, uh, positive emotions win negotiations. So what is the most positive, the, the best and simplest way to, to create those positive emotions? It is fill your sales pipeline. If you genuinely had a full sales pipeline, if you were actually more worried about your ability to deliver than your ability to win, the confidence, the, the fear would disappear and your confidence would just go through the roof. So the, the easiest way to become good at negotiating is to actually make sure that you've got a sales pipe, a full sales pipeline before you go into it. And the mantra that I would suggest that you that you should be adopting would be we uh, we would like your business, but we don't need your business. The minute that you need your business, need it's an it, it, it's not a great position to start from. Uh, nobody wants to, uh, to to deal with anybody that's needy. It's a very unattractive uh, position, and uh, it, it's 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 going to put you on the back foot from from the very beginning. So my urge for all of you would be before you go into any negotiation, you know the best way to over to get the right emotions is to fill your sales pipeline as many opportunities, qualified opportunities that is. Uh, uh, before you go in there. And you know, uh, I've said this for years, a weak sales pipe equals a poor outcome in terms of negotiation. A strong sales pipe equals great outcomes. So uh, uh, in terms of the context, 
Uh, this isn't necessarily one of the 10 rules. It's just something that we think that uh, is really important for people to understand. Uh, get get the pipeline right and then your negotiations, uh, your, uh, forgive me, your emotions are going to be in the right place. So, uh, again, 70% uh, of negotiation is what's going on in your head and you've got to get your belief system in the right place. Uh, we're great fans of Emerson. Emerson's laws on beliefs. So we believe what we're programmed to believe. Uh, programming creates beliefs. Beliefs create attitudes. Attitudes create feelings. Feelings determine actions and behaviour. Actions and behaviour create results. So you've got to examine your belief system. And if you do not believe you're going to win, you will not win. There's a fabulous poem by uh, Walter Wintel, uh, W-I-N-T-L, uh, Forgive me, I forget the name of it. The fabulous, it's, it's probably his most famous piece of work. So if you just uh, Googled Walter Wintle, W-I-N-T, I believe it's L-E, not E-L. Uh, I could be wrong with that. And uh, there's a, it's a great poem on, uh, I think the title is, the, the man who wins is the man who thinks he can. So it's, it's the power of belief. And uh, uh, it's just super, super important that you've got your belief system in the right place. And again, I would suggest you, you, the mantra that you should uh, be following is we would like the business, but we don't need the business. We don't need the business because we've got a full sales pipeline. So uh, em emotions, your belief system uh, are a big part of success when it comes to uh, negotiation. And if you do not have that belief, then uh, you're always going to struggle. If you do not believe when you're in front of a prospect, if you do not believe when you're in front of a customer that what you do delivers value, they can sense it. They're like Dobermans. They, they'll sniff you out and they, they know that you're a fraud. You've absolutely got to believe 100% in the solutions that you do that deliver the value uh, the value to the customer. So uh, again, for us, that, that is super important. And uh, most people, just before we go into the, the actual uh, the, the, the 10 rules. Most people seem to think negotiation is only the part at uh, wh when you've, you've got a proposal on the table, you're maybe in the boardroom and you're negotiating to close the deal. We would respectfully suggest that negotiation starts from the very first contact you're going to have with those prospects. The negotiation in terms of uh, how you're positioning your business how you're positioning the value. You're negotiating on dates and times to have meetings. You're negotiating on what the agenda is going to be in those meetings. So there's lots of points before that actual, uh, what most people believe is the critical point. And I would argue that probably 80% of the sale is done before you get to that end point. You may not, uh, you may not know it, but you know if you mess that front part up, uh, if you're not writing, uh, if your emails don't have the right answers to the, the questions, if you're not asking the right questions, then uh, that, that end part, you, even if you get there, chances are you're only there to make up the numbers because they need three bids. You're only there to make up the numbers and, and you're never going to win. So make sure you understand negotiation starts at the very start. You're positioning the value, positioning your brand, positioning the price. Uh, all of that is just as important as, as the bits further down the road. So uh, moving on, rule number one, uh, be prepared to walk away. This is so, so important. You've got to be prepared to walk away. Uh, negotiation is 70% mindset and 30% strategy. Unless you're prepared to walk away, there is no strategy that's going to help you win because mentally you've already lost. You've mentally conceded. So you've got to be prepared to walk away. And again, forgive me if I keep uh, repeating myself, the mantra should be, we would like the business, but we do not need the business. Not every business is good business. So you've got to understand when, uh, it, you know, when it's perfectly, not just appropriate to walk away, but it's actually the best thing for you and for your business to walk away. You know, uh, to, 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 in, some, some, in some circumstances, Anybody can sell if you're just going to cut the price, if you're just going to throw in uh, and capitulate on terms, that's not sales. 
sales is selling on your price and your terms, uh, and it should always be a win-win. So uh, in order to get there, however, you've got to be prepared to walk away and understand uh, uh, that uh, you cannot, if you're not prepared to walk away, you're going to be needy and that's going to come across in the negotiation and you will, uh, uh, they will use that as leverage against you. And it's not personal, it's business. They're not bad people, they're customers trying to do the best, what they believe is the best for their organisation. So. Uh, please don't take it personally. Uh, rule number two, it's not what you charge, it's what you're worth. So I would suggest that you, know, uh, you thoroughly research the market, know the value that you bring to the table, know the value that you bring to your customers. Uh, what, what impact does what you do have on their balance sheet? That's the value, that's the tangible value. And if you're not sure what that is, go away and do some research on it and, and uh, you know, probably the best place to start to do the research is go to some of your customers and say, I'm excuse me, I'm curious, do you mind if I ask, right, what, uh, uh, what sort of impact does our service, our solutions have on the bottom line of your business? It, it, it's all about results, it's all about value and you need to know what you charge is, is what you're worth and Anybody, any fool can cut price. Uh, there, are, there are numerous uh, examples of business models who have, uh, for, for whatever reason, rightly or wrongly, chosen to go down the route of the lowest price in their particular vertical. Even if you survive, that's a tough market to be in. What, you know, why would you want to do that? Uh, to me, life is too short for that. And most companies, I would suggest, most people, uh, ask yourself on this call, if you're on this call or, or watching this uh, via YouTube, when was the last time you raised your prices? And and then, you know, most, most of you, the answer is going to be maybe six months ago, 12 months ago, maybe even longer. Go and talk to your finance department and ask them uh, when the last time the costs went up. You know, uh, inflation is rife. Uh, power, p p p the cost of power and utilities has gone through the roof. Right? You cannot afford to discount. You cannot afford to discount. Now, you may not be comfortable enough to raise your prices. I get that. Uh, I, 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 I'm not saying that uh, I agree with it, but I get that. However, at least compromise with me and say you're not going to drop your prices. Uh, I, and uh, I, I also acknowledge that it's easy for me to say that because we're in a position with a strong order book, uh, we're in a position with a, a, a reasonably healthy bank balance uh, and a, a good pipeline. So we're in a good position. I understand uh, what it's like not to be in that position because we've been in that position with, with nothing in the bank balance, nothing in the pipeline and nothing in the order books have been there. And I get how you've got to do whatever it is to, to keep the lights on. I, I get that, but... Uh, Please uh, uh, do your best to hold your nerve and, and not drop your prices. Uh, next up, number three, uh, take counsel from colleagues and external advisors and agree a pre-meeting strategy for the negotiations and then practice. So taking counsel. I see so many people who jump into negotiations without talking to other people, without talking to colleagues, senior managers, line managers. They just seem to dive in uh, and uh, haven't discussed a strategy or they or, or they go into a meeting with two or three of the colleagues and they've not agreed the strategy between themselves before that actual meeting and and they end up l literally physically kicking each other under the table because one person's trying to say take one uh, route and another person's taking another route and uh, I guarantee uh, I could name off the top of my head half a dozen uh, uh, salespeople who've ended up kicking somebody else in their team uh, under the table because they've been, uh, they've just got a different approach and they didn't agree the approach before they went in there. So uh, it's just uh, super important. Uh, and, and practice. Uh, if you think about the costs that a business in terms in, invests in terms of marketing, uh, cost of sales to get us salespeople in front of a customer, uh, that's an awful lot of money to uh, 
to, to invest for salespeople to turn around and say, I don't need to practice. Uh, to, to me, it, it would be absolute negligence to go into no sh a negotiation without practicing because the company, all the money they're investing in brand, marketing, uh, cost of sales, as I say, uh, the least they would expect of me as a salesperson would be that I would practice so that I'm, I'm prepared before I get in there. Uh, th th there is no, absolutely no shame in, in practicing. Uh, the, uh, sales is like a sport, I believe. It's very much like a sport. The best, uh, the best sports people uh, are there because they practice and train hard. Uh, and I believe the best salespeople, uh, certainly some of the people that I've been fortunate enough to work with, uh, have always trained hard and worked hard. Rule number four, uh, never give anything away without receiving something of equal or greater value in return. Uh, I cannot remember who came up with that, who told me that. It wasn't me. If you're watching this uh, and you know who it was that came up with that statement, please uh, uh, leave, leave a, a comment for me so that I can give them credit. Uh, it's one of these things that's been with me for many years and I've just forgotten who it was that actually said that. So uh, because it's been with me for years, I really do think it's a great, it's just such a simple basic principle as a starting point uh, fr from a negotiation perspective, whether it's sales or not, never give anything away without receiving something of equal or greater value in return. And, and, and uh, again, most people are going to th be thinking of a scenario where the negotiation, uh, a final contract, a best and final offer. I get that. How, however, uh, one good example for that would be, you know, uh, uh, if, if a customer asks for a proposal, you could then use you know, that same principle, never give anything away without receiving something of equal or greater value in return. Well, Mr. Customer, I'd love to give you a proposal. However, right before we do that, would it be OK if we did X, Y and Z? So use that principle right, to negotiate uh, all through the sales pipeline. Simple things like uh, proposals, simple things like demonstrations, to simple things like meetings. Right, use that same principle, uh, Mr. Customer. Love to come and visit your premises. However, in order that we both get the most value from this meeting, would it make sense if we if we included other people from your decision making team in on that meeting? It's the same principle. Never give anything away without receiving something of equal or greater value in return. And and uh, whilst some of the examples I've maybe just shared with you are not relevant for you and your, your scenario, please just take the principle of it uh, and apply it to your, uh, your sales process uh, uh, and your sales world. Number five, never enter a negotiation without first providing your price and outline terms in advance to anchor the prospect to a higher number and terms. Now, uh, anchoring is a, 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 an NLP thing where uh, you, you're uh, positioning your price, you're positioning your brand in advance. Uh, I would suggest just from a practical perspective, why would you go into any negotiation without the customer knowing what your price and, and, and terms were, uh, your, your high level price and terms? Uh, I, I think that uh, to turn up and somehow ambush them in many cases, uh, they, they could quite rightly say, well, I actually, we actually don't have the budget for that. And you've wasted everybody's time. So before negotiation, uh, I, I would encourage you uh, to make sure that your price and outline terms uh, are, are available to people. And this may be, this may be a, a controversial term, uh, uh, thing to say, I beg your pardon, a controversial thing to say, but I believe it's just much simpler to put your pricing on your website. Just get your pricing on your website. How many times, if you're not sure about this, think about yourself when you're searching for an application, uh, a, a, SaaS, a SaaS product or something, uh, and you come across the, the, the something that looks good, and, and you go to, the, they've got a page that's marked up pricing, right? Uh, and then they say, you know, uh, uh, call to arrange, uh, call to speak to salesperson or something. You know, to me, just put your pricing out there. You know, why would you not be proud of your price? Why would you not be proud of your value? Right, put the pricing out there. 
if you've got a product or service that is it's difficult to give an accurate price because there are many variables i get that but put a bra use bracketing so say okay it's going to be between three and five thousand dollars per month use some form of bracketing but put the price on there because i promise you there are people coming to your website who are interested who are potential buyers but because they can't see a price they just skip off and go to the next website so you know uh, my my suggestion would be to put as much of that stuff out there uh, on your website make it public before uh, and again I, I simply don't think it's the best use of a lot of salespeople's time to be to, to be discussing the base price, you know, whatever that base price is in your world. So uh, uh, either way, if you don't want to put it on the website, I would encourage you to make sure that before any negotiation, you've had that conversation with them about this is roughly what it's going to cost, depending on the terms, depending on on the on the actual deliverables. But it's going to be in this ballpark, and make sure that they're aware of that and comfortable with that price. Uh, number six, in high value deals, do not include your salespeople in negotiations. They are emotionally involved in the sale and not objective. So what do we mean by that? The longer that a deal is in the salesperson's pipeline, the more emotionally involved they are and connected to that deal. And you will find that most people do not then want to disqualify that deal. They don't want to close the deal down uh, as, as in lost. Uh, they, they, they may want to keep it because it looks like the pipeline's fuller than it is, uh, which is a, a, a slightly different scenario. But uh, salespeople are emotionally involved to deals if they've spent a lot of time negotiating. Uh, 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 maybe if, if it's a, a complex sale, they may have uh, had multiple meetings, multiple teams calls over a period of six, 12 months. They're emotionally connected to the buyer. They've got rapport, right? Uh, if, it, if it's that important, take the salespeople out of it, right? And put some, put some, maybe a commercial director or somebody in there who is not emotionally connected to the deal. Uh, and, and I appreciate that for most of you, you may not have that resource. Uh, I get that. Uh, some of our uh, enterprise clients do have those resources and they do this all the time. So uh, it, it's not what I'm telling you. It's not something that's uh, uh, uncommon. It's not something that necessarily we reinvented or created. It, it's, it's a fairly common practice uh, in the enterprise market. So uh, because everybody knows that uh, salespeople get emotionally connected and buyers are emotionally connected as well. So. Uh, 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 when I think back many years ago, when we used to be a supplier to Tesco stores, Tesco stores used to rotate their buyers and suppliers via the alphabet. Uh, they used to change the uh, who, who as, a, uh, as a company selling into them, they used to change our buying contact every six months so that we couldn't get rapport, we couldn't get form any form of a long term relationship. Right, uh, they, they would just move us uh, into another uh, into another buyer. So uh, it, it's quite a common thing, more common than you maybe imagine. Rule number seven: ensure everyone in your team have agreed in advance your trade-offs, your concessions, and your best alternative to a negotiated settlement. So, what's the best alternative if you cannot come to an agreement? What's the best alternative? What's the best outcome? If you cannot come to agreement, uh, and, and that could be to uh, maintain an existing, uh, uh, extend an existing contract that you've got rather than uh, put in a temporary extension, uh, whatever that is in your world, right? Make sure that you've, you understand what is the best alter alternative to a negotiated settlement. And it doesn't necessarily mean uh, that, that both parties walk away and, and, and and there is no business being done. Think about how you could maybe do something short term, right? Uh, 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 short term to get you in the door, right? So uh, until you can get that negotiate uh, final negotiated settlement. So that could look like a pilot. Uh, it, it could be a, a three month trial or something, so that you can then prove uh, prove what you're doing. 
uh, the value of what you're doing, but uh, think about all the different areas where you could uh, potentially keep the relationship going, the 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 the, uh, uh, the contract going if it's an existing contract that's in place, uh, rather than just walk away and and the supplier doesn't win because uh, they they've lost the business and the customer doesn't win because they've got to go and find a new supplier and. Uh, I think most companies would admit finding and onboarding new suppliers is, is quite frankly a, a pain to them uh, and they could well do without it. It's, uh, they don't necessarily change suppliers easily because of, of the just the, the, the simple manners that they have to go through to to then vet the next uh, the next vendor in through the door. Uh, and remember, uh, the, the, all the data is telling us that most buying teams have at least seven people in them nowadays. So the, think of the time and the cost of seven people to then uh, uh, go through that uh, supplier approval process again. So they don't necessarily want to get rid of you. If there's some way that you can come to a mutually beneficial agreement, they're, they're, there's a good chance they will be uh, uh, more than happy to, to uh, have that discussion. Rule number eight. So you must be comfortable with silence uh, and at most you must only talk 30% of the time. The more you talk, the more information you're giving away. So th there will be periods where, uh, where there's going to be silence in the room, silence on a Teams call, silence on a telephone call. You've got to be comfortable with silence and if you feel the need to actually speak to fill that silence, then you don't know it, but you've probably lost. He who speaks first loses in most cases. So you've got to be comfortable with silence and, uh, you know, uh, silence, it, it's not going to kill anybody. It's not a bad thing. It just means that people are thinking. And, and and it could be, well be that if you're in front of an experienced negotiator, it could well be that they are, uh, I would suggest some of them will be playing games with you. So uh, uh, you've got to get comfortable with silence. And, and just remember, talking, uh, over talking uh, is not a good thing because the more that you're talking, you're giving your position away. The, the, the less words that come out of your mouth, Right, the less damage that you can do. So uh, uh, speak the minimum, right, and, uh, and and just make sure that you're focused on listening. Listening, watch the body language, uh, and you won't go far wrong there. Number nine. So uh, number nine, negotiation is between human beings. Therefore, you must be familiar with human psychology. So things that I would suggest you look at would be uh, Karpman's Triangle. Uh, that's Daniel Karpman, K-A-R-P-M-A-N-S, uh, Daniel uh, Karpman's Triangle by Daniel Karpman. Uh, another great book, I'm sure lots of you have, have probably already read it, but uh, The Chimp Paradox by Professor Steve Peters, I believe. Uh, fantastic book on human psychology. Uh, Lots of uh, lots of other ones. Uh, another good one, more geared towards change, but but negotiation is part of change. Would be our iceberg is melting uh, by John Cotter from Harvard. So lots of uh, good books on this uh, subject. Uh, uh, human psychology, DISC, uh, neuro linguistic uh, uh, programming, NLP. Uh, all of those are super important. Uh, NLP is based around your five senses. Uh, it's not something uh, you can ex probably explain in five minutes, but again, it's hugely important uh, and you don't need to be an NLP expert uh, if you've just got an understanding of the basics and can use the basics of NLP, it will absolutely help you. Uh, and DISC is another one that we love because it helps helps understand the, the behavioural styles of people, which uh, uh, if you can understand their uh, preferred style, it will help you understand what their drivers are. So uh, all of those are uh, uh, really important that you've got an understanding of them. Uh, last but not least, in any way, uh, rule number 10, if it's not win-win, then you run the danger of the prospect backing out 
for failing to implement your agreement, then the lawyers are the only winners. Uh, uh, it's got to be win-win. Uh, you've got to, I would suggest also, and, and uh, take that, taking that a step further, I would say it's got to be ethical. It's got to be fit with the values of your organisation. Uh, and you've got to be uh, thinking about what happens after this contract in terms of look, th th think of the long game, play the long game, think about uh, the next contract and the one after that. Uh, you can walk out of a deal having won uh, and you've potentially tied your your uh, customer up in knots and, and, and commercially you, you're going to make great money out of it. Uh, however, if at some point the customer realises in some way what's going to happening and it just leaves a bad taste in their mouth, then that relationship is gone forever. You know, uh, a lot of people just would find it difficult to come back to you if they think that in some way you've, uh, for want of a better expression, stitched them up. So I, I would uh, suggest you be as honest and as ethical as you can and make sure it's win-win. Uh, win at all costs is in, in commercial business. Uh, it's just not something that I would be comfortable with. It's not something that I would agree with. And I don't think that long term you're going to do your personal brand or your company brand any favours whatsoever. So uh, rule number 10, if it's not win win, uh, then uh, you, I would suggest uh, it's going to end up uh, uh, it's just going to end up uh, in a bad space. So, moving on. So, uh, I appreciate we'd set aside an hour. Uh, we're finishing uh, 13.32, we're finishing early. Uh, if, uh, if you've got any questions, please feel free to drop them in the comments uh, on LinkedIn uh, or indeed on the YouTube video. Uh, it's, uh, I'm always amazed how many people uh, turn up for these, uh, register and turn up for these events. So, super grateful to you. Uh, and uh, have a great uh, sales week, what's left of it. Thank you so much, folks.